So uh, DuPont got a patent on the chloramine process and thought that that might be an end to the issue of biofouling, and it really wasn't. But the other studies were that actually if you didn't chlorinate at all, okay, you were better off in the rates of biofouling than when you had chlorine dechlorination. That's why a lot of people thought the chlorine dechlorination uh, was the pr production of the AOCs was producing the biofilm, inducing the biofilm formation. But uh, uh, later on, I'm going to show data that it's not really AOCs generated. It's these viable but not culturable bacteria that are important that I'll explain that become resuscitated in this mechanism of chlorine dechlorination. And then there was a conference in Tokyo, Yokohama, where a Middle East guy who was very important in seawater RO development in the Middle East, uh, Dr. Darwish al Gubasi, went to this conference and at the conference says, SW, seawater RO will never work because they'll never solve the biofouling issue. And this caused an uproar because this, especially for people in the RO business, you know, this is like the kiss of death to the future of RO because this fella is very important in Abu Dhabi and he's saying it'll never work, okay? Then in 95, uh, uh, DuPont supported studies and we did analysis that is the first time we saw that we could reduce the rate of biofouling with the DuPont membranes by adjusting the crossflow velocity. One of the f issues with DuPont membranes is they had this, what we call the minimum brine flow rate. Now, in spirals, you, you also have a minimum brine flow rate, but it's not as uh, crucial. Well, with DuPont, they had such a low minimum brine flow rate that the crossflow velocities were very low, and, and they were achieving high uh, conversions, but at the price of very low crossflow velocity. And what we first saw was if we increase the crossflow velocity on these DuPont membranes, this is the first indication that crossflow velocity, remember Tony Fain talked about crossflow velocity yesterday as being very important. There are paper, many papers published by Menachem Elimelech at Yale University, myself and Tony, that as you increase crossflow velocity, you decrease fouling. And now we saw it with DuPont. The problem DuPont would always say is, if you increase the crossflow velocity, you have to lower your conversion. And what do people want when they build an RO plant? Water. So they didn't want to go as high on the conversion. Now, in the Middle East, they were biofouling. They were trying to achieve 45 to 50 percent conversion with these DuPont membranes. Now, I was doing a lot of consulting work in the Caribbean, and they had the same DuPont membranes in the Caribbean. But in the Caribbean, they're mainly for hotels and, and complexes like that they don't run their conversions at 45 to 50. They were running them around 35 percent. So in the Caribbean, most of the DuPont membranes were being run at higher cross-flow velocities, lower conversions. And the biofouling didn't occur in the Caribbean as it was occurring in the Middle East. <coughs> then uh, in uh, uh, the early 90s, I I had a contract with the U.S. government to train uh, 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 Saudi Arabia scientists into biofouling uh, in RO. And we looked at the fact that cross flow velocity was important. But the Middle East people said, I would say, well, look, same membrane. I run it in the Caribbean, it doesn't biofoul run it in the Middle East, it's biofouling. I looked at the microbiology because in the early days, uh, us old dinosaurs um, like Harry and myself, we, we didn't have genomics to uh, look at the exact, we had to do plate counts and identify the bacteria the old-fashioned way and identify. 
But when I looked at the type of heterotrophic bacteria in the Caribbean versus the Red Sea or the Arabian Gulf, it was the same type of organism. But the Middle East people kept saying there are special organisms. And that's why they biofoul in the Arabian Gulf in the Red Sea and not in the Caribbean Sea because they have these special bacteria that are very biologically active and turn out to be hogwash. It's not true. It's how they were running their plants in the Middle East versus how they were running. Then in 92, uh, 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 Kevin Marshall uh, wrote a paper about that microbes were actually colloidal uh, particles. Okay. Now, Kevin is a very important person in biofouling. He was uh, um, taught microbiology here at University of New South Wales. Very distinguished scientist, unfortunately passed away several years ago. And I first came to uh, indirectly know Kevin because when I first signed on to do my PhD work at Columbia University, Bill Corp says, oh, by the way, this is your project, and I'm going to, on a sabbatical to, to Australia to uh, work with Kevin Marshall uh, on biofouling. So Bill left me for a year on my own, and he went and uh, did some great work with Kevin. But being microbes as colloids is very important because it now enables you to see uh, how they can interact with surfaces, being a colloidal particle, and uh, now you come into the uh, ch charges being very important, and Kevin's work is very important. Then Tony Fain, I met Tony Fain in 93 at a IMSTEC conference right here at New South Wales, University of New South Wales, and Tony talked about critical flux. Tony uh, is the father of critical flux. Well, not the father, but he's one of the founding people on the concept of critical flux. And, uh, and at the same time, we had a biofouling workshop during the INSTEC conference. And I started talking to Tony. I said, you know, this critical flux makes sense to me because it, it, it depends upon cross flow velocity and it depends upon recovery critical flux. And I said, what can critical flux, we know critical flux you can measure it, and you know it in, in MF and UF. Would it work in reverse osmosis? And Tony said, I see no reason why critical flux won't hold in uh, seawater RO as it does in UF and MF. And so we started to work with the critical flux concept. And we were supported, Tony and myself, by the Middle East Desal Research Center metric, which Dave Farakawa uh, was on the advisory board. And thank you, Dave, for funding our project. <laughs> uh, and uh, I'll talk about critical flux. But the critical flux mainly said each phalan has a certain critical flux. If you go above that critical flux, the organism will go to the surface. If you stay below that critical flux, it won't. So of course that's saying that if there's a critical flux, there's a critical recovery. And of course, uh, what that says is for the DuPont membrane, if you try to go higher and higher with your recovery, you're going to go above that critical flux. And the chances of, of, of fouling become greater. If you stay below the critical flux, it won't. Now, you heard from Loren on transparent exopolymer particles identified in seawater by this Alcyon blue. Well, uh, when I was a grad student and postdoc with Bill Corp, we used Alcyon blue to measure these acidic glycoproteins present. Okay? Of course, we didn't call them TEP, and they were soluble, and they would stain with Alcyon blue as a way of for us to measure the concentration of these chemically conditioning molecules, they were produced either by the algae in seawater or by bacteria. So we looked at seawater, algae, and blue, but we didn't really get into the transparent exopolymer. We looked at the dissolved organic acidic glycoproteins being produced. 
And then with Tony, we identified the flux and cross as a major cause of SWRO fouling. Okay, so it gives you a little history of how I got involved in this biofouling story. And when I first got involved, I thought it would be, you know, a short-lived uh, uh, career. And here I am uh, from 1975 now, uh, 35 years later, still uh, talking about biofouling and seeing it as an important problem to overcome. And this is Kevin. Uh, he was the show his photo because um, he was one of the important people uh, in the biofouling world uh, and he passed away in 2010. Okay, and he worked with Bill Corp at Columbia and, um, and uh, Ralph Mitchell at Harvard University. And uh, he said that cells, but the biofilm is really bacterial cells immobilized uh, in this organic polymer matrix, which is not necessarily uniform in time and space. And then he uh, wrote this book with Charker Alice, who, again, another great uh, person in biofilms in on on 1990, which is sort of the Bible to uh, understanding biofilms. Okay, now the thing about biofilms, uh, they wouldn't be such a problem if they uh, didn't affect your flux, your salt passage, and most important, your energy. Because I'm going to show that as the biofilm forms, your energy numbers go up. Okay, so energy becomes a very important issue. Today we see you can buy newer and more permeable membranes on the market. And the amount of energy being used, because as the membranes become more permeable, uh, you, you can run these uh, membranes at lower pressures, and um, thus the energy levels are much lower. But the thing is, because they are highly permeable, their flux is greater, so you've got to be careful on the concentration polarization effect and critical flux. Fouling consequences, we all know about it and we're very important on the effect of flux and cross flow velocity. Okay, now back to, there are two things that are important in biofouling, bacteria and organics. So let, let's first look at bacteria and VBNC resuscitation. What are VBNC bacteria? They make up 99.9% .9 of the bacteria in seawater. They're viable but not culturable. So if you take seawater and take it to your laboratory and then try to um, grow the bacteria in the lab, you will only get about 1% of the total population growing. They form in seawater because uh, uh, seawater has very low nutrients and they seem to be killed off. And the medias you use in the laboratory are high nutrient media. And so what happens is that these uh, bacteria, VBNC, produce uh, free radicals that kill them cells, and so you don't get their growing uh, uh, in the type of media like uh, Zobel 2216 media. And the thing is that bacteria go into the VBNC state, which we call inducement, because it, it, the, the seawater is a stressful environment, very low nutrients, and uh, uh, the bacteria in the VBNC state reproduce maybe every 50 days. They're still alive, but they have very slow metabolism versus the heterotrophic forms, which reproduce every 30 minutes. Okay? But you can resuscitate them okay, back into the heterotrophic form. They're very small, about 0.2, less than 0.2 microns, and they belong to they're either alpha or beta proteobacteria group. So in seawater, we have two groups. Those you can grow in your laboratory called heterotrophic bacteria, and those that don't grow, but you can stain them and see them as present by microscopic.